Welcome to today's webinar. Before we introduce the speaker, I want to make a few brief announcements. We know many of you are listening in from far away and can't attend local events or programs. That is the main reason we provide this free webinar series. We host multiple webinars per month, so please visit our website to view the current schedule. The 2017 schedule will be added soon, so if you are not on our email list, I encourage you to visit our website and click on the Join Our Email List link that appears on the home page. To get instant news and events from the Johnson Center, follow us on Facebook and Twitter as we often announce grant and scholarship opportunities, research opportunities, and last-minute events and presentations there. You can find links for these on our website at www.johnson-center.org. For those of you nearby, we invite you to attend our annual holiday open house on December 8th from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. Mr. and Mrs. Claus will be here and there will be allergen-friendly treats, a story time, pictures with Santa, and more. This is a free event you just need to RSVP. You can see the invitation on our Facebook page and on the blog link on our website. Be sure to follow our colleagues at the Austin Re Autism Research Institute as they host their own webinar initiative and they share some great resources on their website and social media pages. Before we begin the presentation, please note that questions may be typed into your control panel throughout the presentation and, time permitting, they will be addressed during the presentation. Also, for those who have requested copies of the presentation, we don't send out the presentation slides. However, we do post recordings of all of our free webinars on the Johnson Center YouTube channel. Please search for us on YouTube and subscribe to get full access to all of our recorded webinars. We are offering certificates of attendance for this webinar, and a link to complete a short quiz will be emailed to you one hour after the presentation. Once you successfully complete the quiz, you'll be able to download your certificate. Now, please welcome our presenter, presenter, Gina Hill. Gina earned her BA in psychology with a minor in early childhood intervention from Texas State University. She then went on to obtain her master's degree in family and child studies on the child life track. Gina is a certified child life specialist and is trained in child development, special education, early intervention, family systems and stress, and developmental disabilities. Gina has extensive experience working with children and families in various settings, including residential facilities, educational facilities, children's hospitals, and medical clinics. She has worked with hundreds of families here at the Johnson Center, providing resources, emotional support, and guidance during stressful experiences. Please welcome Gina. Hello everyone, my name is Gina and I'm looking forward to sharing some information with you that I believe to be essential to both parents and healthcare providers. I'd like to also thank Sierra, she is our current Child Life Practicum student here and she contributed to this presentation. I hope that after listening to today's webinar, our audience will not only have a general understanding of patient and family-centered care, but also gain knowledge on specific strategies that can be used to empower and strengthen collaboration between healthcare team members and patients and families. So today we will be discussing the history and relevance of patient and family-centered care, talking through why this type of framework is important and reviewing how it directly affects parents and providers. We will review how to integrate this type of approach in your current organization, as well as discuss ways to assess the current level of patient and family-centered care your organization is implementing. My goal for our audience is to be able to really identify ways to implement patient and family-centered care in every interaction, in every environment, and in every healthcare experience. So what is patient and family-centered care? According to the Institute of Family-Centered Care, this is an approach to the planning, delivery, and evaluation of health care that encourages partnerships between patients, families, and healthcare providers. It redefines the relationships in healthcare. 
It's the understanding that the family is the patient's primary source of support and therefore it plays a vital role in ensuring health and well-being of patients. Based on this approach, clinical decision making recognizes the value in information provided by the family. Recent literature has linked patient and family centered care to improved health outcomes of patients, stronger collaboration between parents and healthcare providers, increased communication between staff members, greater child and family satisfaction with their medical experience, as well as long term benefits. Facilities that incorporate patient and family-centered care into their practice also recognize the advances in building a stronger, more competitive workplace, as well as enhancing the learning environment for future professionals. This approach can shape pediatric settings, policies, facility design, and daily interactions between patients and families. Clinicians that integrate patient and family-centered care into their practice recognize the importance of emotional, social, and developmental support that family members provide. They also reinforce the concept of treating the whole person and not just the diagnosis. In fact, this type of approach helps practitioners identify the need to support the entire family, recognizing that the medical experience can affect all family members. There are four core principles of patient and family-centered care. Dignity and respect, in which healthcare providers listen to and honor patient and family perspective and choices. Patients and families' knowledge, values, beliefs, and cultural, cultural backgrounds are incorporated into care planning and decision making. Parents, briefly take a moment to think about a time when you felt your healthcare provider was not validating your concerns. Information sharing. Healthcare providers communicate and share complete and unbiased information with patients and families in ways that are affirming and useful. Patients and families also receive timely, complete, and accurate information in order to effectively participate in care and decision making. Again, parents, think about a time when this could have been useful in determining your child's treatment plan. Participation. Patients and families are encouraged and supported in participating in care and decision making. Now healthcare providers that are tuning in, it's your turn. So think about a time when you felt that this could have been a useful strategy. Have you ever had an experience where you felt parents could have been more involved? Where you felt that maybe parents didn't provide enough information? And last, collaboration. Patients, families, and providers collaborate in policy and program development, in implementation and assessment, in healthcare facility design, in professional participation, as well as delivery of care. So now is the time for change in integrating a patient and family-centered care approach in your medical setting. And later, we will be discussing specific ways that we can do so. The Institute for Family-Centered Care ensures that the principles are reflected in all systems providing care and support to individuals including health, education, mental health, and social service. Through the development of policy and research initiatives, training, technical assistance, and on-site consultations, the Institute serves as a primary resource for increasing the understanding necessary to build an effective partnership between practitioners and families. In addition to the core principles, the Institute of Family-Centered Care has defined core elements to patient and family-centered care, including recognizing the family as a constant in the child's life, facilitating parent-professional collaboration at all levels of healthcare, honoring the racial, ethnic, cultural, and socioeconomic diversity of families, designing healthcare that is flexible, culturally competent, and responsive to a family's needs, adopting policies and practices that provide families with emotional and financial support, responding to child and family development needs as part of the healthcare practice, encouraging and facilitating family to family support and networking, 
sharing complete and unbiased information with families on a continuous basis, and recognizing family strengths and individuality and respecting different methods of coping. So why is this important? Now that we have a general understanding of the concept of fa patient and family-centered care, let's go back to the beginning and review why this type of approach is so important today. Initially, children were admitted to the hospital without their parents. Parents were not allowed to visit or could visit their child during limited hours on specific days. There was fear of spreading infection, although research later suggested that infection rates did not increase when parents were allowed visitation. As you can imagine, the separation caused distress on both the patient and the family. We have seen significant changes in restrictive visiting hours in hospital environments. However, at the time, this was seen as the norm. And in some cases for children who were hospitalized for long periods of time, they did not see their parents for over the course of a year. So again, while we have significantly improved and advanced our understanding of the impact of hospitalizations on early childhood development, there is still room for improvement. Much of healthcare today emphasizes the science of medicine, focusing on the disease and not the patient. By providing more of a holistic approach, healthcare providers can support many of the additional factors that could be affecting treatment, such as family stress and, in, and anxiety. Many studies have found cases in which children experienced psychological trauma as a result of limited exposure to caregivers during hospitalizations. And psychiatrists began to trace conditions in adults to the early childhood trauma of hospitalizations. Although results of several studies indicated there was a need for parent involvement during a ho child's hospital stay, initial moves to allow parents to visit their child in the hospital were slow to begin. It wasn't until World War II where families really suffered from the separation of their loved one that people began to recognize the need for family involvement. And this was seen as a catalyst for many changes in healthcare. In the well-known study of A Two-Year-Old Goes to the Hospital by John Volby and James Robertson, they focused on the effects of separation of parent and child due to hospital admission. They completed several films documenting the changes in behavioral responses and development of a young child during her hospital stay. Direct changes in her response to her caregiver were seen throughout the film as she becomes more isolated and less responsive to her mom. This study can be credited to the development of family-centered care. Over the course of time, many advocated for parental involvement in hospitals. Various associations were created, including the National Association for the Welfare, Wel Welfare of Children in Hospitals, later changed to Action for Sick Children, in the U.S., the Association for the Care of Children's Health was formed that included healthcare professionals and later integrated parents as members. And most recently, the Institute for Family-Centered Care was established and has had input in many healthcare initiatives in the U.S. I would encourage our listeners to visit their website to learn more about the policies and procedures associated with patient and family-centered care. In addition, there was increased awareness on policies that should also promote including patients in their own treatment plan. A patient-centered approach recognizes the need to ensure involvement of patients in their own healthcare experience and to better inform patients of treatment options as well as improve patients' and families' access to information. As mentioned previously, throughout history, we have seen a shift in how hospitals identify and treat patients and families. Even so, in most recent times, we still see restrictive visiting policies that affect patient care. There's long been a sense of misconception that the presence of families interfere with care, may exhaust the patient, or may spread infection. And like we discussed earlier, there's no evidence to support those beliefs. Yet many medical environments are slow to change their policies to provide more of a patient and family-centered environment. 
As practitioners and parents, we really need to advocate for change and reform and help, help our healthcare communities become more patient and family-centered. We will now be discussing the practitioner's role in patient and family-centered care, as well as reviewing the benefits of applied tools and strategies. Family-centered care is extremely important in pediatrics, as treatment planning is heavily determined by relying on parent report. In this setting, it's imperative that the clinical team understand that the family is the child's primary source of support and to recognize the parent's perspective as a benefit in creating a patient's individualized treatment plan. Clinicians should respect the views of parents and use that as a tool to assess the child's ability and treatment. Family-centered practitioners should also acknowledge the emotional, social, and developmental supports as important parts of a child's healthcare experience. In doing so, these clinicians are supporting the whole child and not just the diagnosis. Some concrete ways to promote dignity and respect in your hospital would be to make sure that the TV call button working, is working in the rooms and that the family has access to Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi password. Make sure families know where phones and computers are located. Educate families on visitor policies and chaplain services. Encourage families to bring pictures, toys, blankets from home to make the room their own. Stock rooms with a pull-out couch or showering and cleaning items for parents and siblings. And make sure families know about the playroom, family resource center, kitchenettes. And you can also offer families and patients toys, activities, or books. There are many benefits healthcare providers can expect when practicing family-centered care, including information sharing. This builds a stronger alliance with the family while promoting each child's health and development. There is also opportunity for improved clinical decision-making based on better information and a collaborative process. For example, most recently we had a patient come in to complete blood work. Serving as our child life specialist, I met with the family to review previous support measures that have been effective and discuss specific interests the child has that may be helpful in providing distraction during the procedure. The family provided minimal information and the procedure was done without any specific support measures put in place. After the first attempt, the parent identified that the child does respond to the iPad an iPad was brought in and used as a successful tool in distracting the patient. Without the parent's input, we would not have known to use that as a measure of support. From the first experience to the next, there was a drastic difference in how the child responded. In the first scenario, the child was visibly distraught. In the second scenario, the child was able to sit still with the help of a parent and attend to the video on the iPad while his blood was being taken. So to review, it's so imperative that healthcare professionals not only support parent in involvement, but really advocate and validate parents as important parts of the healthcare team process and support their views in helping them to shape their child's healthcare experience. Some concrete ways you can promote information sharing would be to ask parents on their thoughts about the child's situation or illness ask them for observations about their child's behavior or previous responses to treatment. You can prepare children and families for procedures and surgeries ahead of time by giving them a tour of the treatment room or explaining all of the sensations the child will feel, explaining what the normal reactions are to the procedure to the child and the family, and asking the family if they have any questions. You could connect families to support groups inside and outside of your setting inviting nurses and other medical staff to attend some of these in order for in information sharing to occur to family to family, to staff to family, and family to staff. You could host patient rounds within each room so that the patient and parent may be a part of rounds and educate parents about parent resources, 
and how parents can learn more about their child's diagnosis or procedure. Nursing change of shift report could be conducted at the bedside with the patient and the family. And charting and documentation systems capturing the goals, priorities, concerns, and observations of patients and families and ensuring patient and family-centered care should be easily accessible. Additionally, working alongside patients and families, healthcare providers should take into account patient participation. Healthcare providers should encourage patient participation in providing choices on treatment methods. The more patients and families are viewed as part of the team, the more compliant they may be. This will aid in increasing following up with treatment and would also lead to more efficient and effective use of professional time and healthcare resources. As parents have a better understanding of their child's healthcare needs, more case management and care can be done from home, decreasing hospital stays over long periods of time. Concrete ways to promote participation would be to encourage parents to have their younger children sit on their lap for IV starts in order to have the parent participate in the procedure. This is called comfort positioning. You could also encourage the parent to have opportunities to change their child's diaper or help take their child a bath instead of only having the nurse provide these services so that parents feel as if they are supported and not undermined in their parenting roles. You could encourage parents to pre be present during procedure preparation and procedures and parents and families should be involved in transition and discharge planning. Parent listeners, have you ever felt the treatment plan proposed by your clinician was so complex that it was too complicated to start? Have you ever been so overwhelmed with the medical jargon that the recommendations seem so convoluted? Wouldn't it instead be so much easier if your voice was part of the discussion and recommendations were made with your input? where you could confidently discuss what steps need to be taken for your child's health and well-being, and you were able to determine what you realistically would be able to implement over the course of treatment. Compliance would not only be higher, but practitioners would then see better outcomes for their patients, as parents were able to understand the treatment process and stay accountable. Therefore, there is improved follow-through when the plan of care is developed collaboratively with families. Concrete ways to establish collaboration would be to establish collaborative self-management support, which is an approach where patients and families are encouraged and supported in setting goals and action plans. You could again conduct rounds in a conductive, sorry, you then could conduct rounds that facilitate patients and families in the communication. And you could establish patient and family advisors to be partners for change and improvement in healthcare settings and in institutions educating future physicians. You could establish patient and family advisory councils to assess quality improvement as well as patient safety initiatives. Patient and family-centered care is not only beneficial to the clinical team, but to the hospital experience and the medical environment as well. Many surveys found that healthcare environments that integrate a patient and family-centered care approach score higher on patient satisfaction after discharge. These patients are likely to come back to a facility rather than choose a different provider. This results in a more competitive working environment as hospitals and various medical clinics are able to bring in more patients. Patient satisfaction is also an important indicator of evaluating the performance of a healthcare system. Satisfaction with care not only influences a family's likelihood to change providers, but also, also their likelihood to change healthcare plans, avoid physician visits, or file lawsuits. Along with increased patient satisfaction, Viewing family members as vital team members has been shown to decrease risks. In the Joint Commission Center for Transforming Healthcare Project, results showed that 35% of patient falls 
were reduced as a result of patient and families taking an active role in their own safety. The American Society of Healthcare Risk Management stated that families of patients are not just visitors, but are vital parts of the team caring for the patient. Their partnership is seen as a proactive approach to risk management. The National Patient Safety Foundation affirms that patients and families play a significant role in preventing medical errors. So what can we do? Healthcare providers tuning in today may be thinking, what can I do? How do I get started? And here are a couple of steps. You could provide opportunities for continued education and training. Similar to today's webinar, I encourage those healthcare providers listening today to share this information with your staff, as well as encourage your leadership staff to incorporate this into future training material. You could appoint a patient and family-centered steering committee on both patients and families and informal and formal leaders of the organization. You could assess current concepts and principles of patient and family-centered care that are being implemented within your own working environment. You can share information with children and families in ways that are affirming and ensure that these systems are put in place that help facilitate access to additional support services for children and families. You can encourage and help facilitate family-to-family -family support services, which can be really helpful for families of sim similar cultural backgrounds or with families that may have children with similar medical conditions. I know that we may have many parent listeners here with us today, and this next section will be reviewing ways that you can get involved and make your voice heard. Earlier in the webinar, we briefly discussed the impact of hospitalizations on early childhood development. Research found significant developmental delays and behavioral responses when young children were hospitalized for long periods of time and separated from family members, isolating patients at their most vulnerable time from the people who know them best placed them at risk for medical error and emotional harm. Over time, we have seen a significant shift in how we value and integrate parents as active participants in the healthcare team. Various models have been developed, including care by parent, in which parents retain responsibility for the child while still being in the care of healthcare professionals. Another model, the partnership in care, was later designed, which incorporated two principles. The first, that nursing care for a child in the hospital can be given by parents with the support and education from a nurse, or two, that families or parental caregivers can be given by the nurse if the family is absent. This model assumed that the daily living responsibilities of the child was the parent's responsibility, while the nurse's responsibility was that of education and support. Currently, patient and family-centered care has become widely accepted by most, most healthcare professionals. One research article suggested that this is a way of caring for children and families within health services that ensures that care is planned around the entire family and in which all family members are recognized as care recipients. This type of rationale suggests that parents take an active role in their child's medical experience that they are subject to the stress and anxiety brought on by their child's illness, but if patient and family-centered care is not implemented, they may still feel like bystanders in their child's care. In addition, parents may feel helpless toward their child's treatment, even though they're truly the experts in their child's care, as they know their child best. Even adult patients are affected by separation of loved ones. Again, there's no current evidence to support the beliefs that uh, families will interfere with patient care, exhaust the patient, or spread infection. In fact, research indicates that for older parents, hospitalizations for acute or critical illnesses have been associated with cognitive impairment 
and family members are more acutely aware of these changes compared to hospital staff. Therefore, they could actually be valuable resources during hospitalizations in reporting these changes. For some adult patients, fear of how they will respond to medication or treatment may be higher when isolated. In one study, a patient reported that she was scared she was going to die due to a pre previous reaction to pain medication. She reported that her husband and her mother knew of her previous reaction, but were not allowed to stay in the room. In moments of time when you're the weakest, weakest, it's hard to imagine not having a support system in place to help provide comfort and security. Patient and family-centered care can improve patient and family outcomes in many ways. Family presence during procedures decreases anxiety for the child as well as parents. Studies suggest that when parents are prepared, they do not prolong the procedure or make the provider more anxious. In my experience working with patients and families, it's been really helpful to include parents and give them specific roles during a medical procedure. For example, some of our parents may experience high anxiety when their child has to complete blood work. If we provide parents with concrete expectations and ask for assistance in providing distraction, this can help alleviate some of that stress. Parents can then focus on providing comfort for the child, um, providing distractions such as counting, singing, while the nurse focuses on completing the blood draw. This collaborative effort really provides a positive experience for the patient, parent, and provider. Patient and family-centered care also provides families with increased opportunities for attachment and bonding, which is especially important for a neonatal population. One study of patients in the neonatal intensive care unit found that infants who experienced less interaction and stimulation by a caregiver were more likely to report being abused or neglected later on. Family-centered care can contribute to prevention of these negative outcomes by recognizing the importance of early stages of bonding and attachment with the primary caregiver. Providing a patient and family-centered care approach can also lead to decreased anxiety for parents. And this is extremely important when working in the pediatric st setting as studies have been found that a parent's emotional response has a direct impact on a child's behavior. One study found that the parents who experienced isolation from their child during hospitalizations were more likely to be at risk of depression, which later contributed to higher reported incidences of behavioral problems in children. Moving on, let's discuss ways in which we can advance the practice of patient and family-centered care into clinical settings. Establishing patient and family-centered care requires a long-term commitment. Clinicians should actively consider how they can ensure core concepts of patient and family-centered care and how they're being implemented in their current working environment. In collaboration with families and other healthcare professionals, clinicians should examine the systems of care, individual interactions with patients and families, as well as patient flow, and should modify these as needed to improve patient care. The Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care outlines specific steps on how we can help set up medical environments for successful integration of patient and family-centered care. A key step is to assess which concepts and principles are currently being implemented within your own working environment. Using the assessment toolkit found on the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care website, your initial hospital assessment should review your organizational culture and philosophy of care. So evaluating if your organization's vision, mission, philosophy of care reflect the principles of patient and family-centered care, as well as promote partnership with patients and families served. You should review if patient and family participation in organizational or advisory roles 
are in effect. So you can evaluate if your organization has patient and family advisory councils or if patients and families serve on committees and work groups involved in patient safety and quality improvement. You should review and consider the architecture and design of your medical environment. So look at creating welcoming impressions throughout the facility that reflect the diversity of patients and families, support the presence and participation of family members, and support the collaboration of staff across disciplines with patients and families. You should also review patterns of care. So are family members always welcome to be with the patient and not viewed as visitors? Are our patients and families viewed as essential members of the healthcare team? You should review patient and family access to information. So again, are there systems in place to ensure that families have access to complete, unbiased, and useful information? And are there a variety of support programs and resources for patients and families, including peer and family support? You should also review education and training programs. Do orientation and education programs prepare staff, physicians, and trainees for patient and family-centered practice and collaboration with patients and families and other practitioners? After reviewing the assessments, it's important to develop an action plan and begin to incorporate specific strategies into the hospital's strategic priorities. The assessment inventory is designed to assist those that complete it with information to determine priorities for change and improvement. Many who have completed the assessment found it to be of educational value as it helps inform participants of the core concepts and strategies of patient and family-centered care. The assessment inventory is divided into 10 sections, including leadership, mission and definition of quality, charting and documentation, patients and families as advisors, patient and family support, patterns of care, quality improvement, information education for patients and families, personnel, and environment and design. So as you complete the assessment and make changes, you may use the assessment tool for completing additional assessments at the unit, department, and service level. You may also continue to reevaluate as needs may change over time, and we must continue to evolve to meet the needs of patients and families. It's important that as changes are made, you monitor and evaluate the process, measure impact, and continue to advance practice. Again, as the needs of our patients and families change, we must also be willing to grow and change to meet those needs. And it's important to continue to strive to provide greater patient care and offer quality health care. Parents, it is your right to take an active role in your child's health and well-being. Collaboration is the foundation of patient and family-centered care. In discussing your child's treatment plan, make sure to consider if your practitioner is providing you with mutual respect, honest, clear communication, understanding and empathy, mutually agreed upon goals, shared planning and decision making, open communication and sharing of information, accessibility and responsiveness, joint evaluation of progress, and absence of labeling and blaming. Patients and families can and should use their voice in expressing their concerns, fears, frustrations, and be confident that their practitioner will not only listen but validate those concerns. Patients can express their opinions and have choices in how treatment is conducted. Patients should verbalize when support is necessary, such as a husband or wife being present during a painful procedure. Patient and family-centered care has considerable impact on our health care system. This model of care provides a framework and strategies for incre increasing quality and safety goals 
enhancing market shares, lowering costs, and strengthening staff, staff, staff satisfaction. With that said, most importantly, it has the ability to create opportunities to unite parents and professionals and build stronger communities of support. For parents of children with developmental delays, it's so important to find a practitioner that will meet the unique needs of your family. Finding an environment that is inclusive and receptive to the individual's needs. Going back to the core principles of patient and family centered care, an important step is to remember to always provide dignity and respect. Honor racial, ethnic, cultural, and socioeconomic diversity and its effect on the family's experience and perception of care. Recognize and build on the strengths of patients and families, even in difficult and challenging situations. Ensure flexibility in organizational policies, procedures, and provider practices for services that could be tailored to the needs, beliefs, and cultural values of each patient and family. Share honest and unbiased information with families on an ongoing basis and in ways they find useful and affirming. Support choices made by patients and families in regards to their treatment and care and empower each child and family to discover their own strengths, build confidence, and make choices and decisions about their health. Collaborate with families at all healthcare levels in the care of the individual child and in professional education, policy making, and program development. And advocate for parent participation and support during and emphasize the importance of involvement of patients in their own healthcare decisions. For this last section, I'd like each of you to take a moment to consider your own attitudes and beliefs. If you're a parent, consider your own involvement in previous healthcare experiences and take time to consider how you would respond to an advisory role. For practitioners, consider how your beliefs affect how you practice and how you work with patients and families. Some questions to consider would be, do I believe that patients and family members bring unique perspectives and expertise to the clinical relationship? Do I encourage patients and families to speak freely? Do I listen respectfully to the opinions of patients and families? Do I encourage patients and families to participate in decision making about their care? Today, patient and family-centered care continues to build and is supported by a growing body of research, as well as prestigious organizations such as the Institute of Medicine. Supported by the commitment of an expanding number of healthcare professionals, patient and family-centered care may have a strong and positive effect on our future healthcare. At this time, I'd like to take an opportunity to answer any questions that you may have. I'd also like to quickly just review some of the references if anyone is interested in additional information on patient and family-centered care. Again, I would really encourage our audience to look at the website of the Institute of Patient and Family-Centered Care as they have a lot of resources that could really be um, an advantage if you'd like to provide this type of um, patient and family-centered care in your working environment or if you're a parent and you're interested in more resources and supports. In addition, for more webinars or information, you could follow us on YouTube. Um, and you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter as we post links to our webinars.
I'd like to take a moment now to answer a question that was brought in. The question states, I am a parent and I feel uncomfortable bringing up some of my concerns with communication with my primary physician. Um, who can I talk to so that I feel like my voice is heard? So that's a great question and I feel like many audience members can relate to this. There may have been times where you felt like your voice hasn't been heard or you didn't have as much input, input as you would like um, in creating your child's treatment plan. So I think the first step would be to talk to your nurse, um, your medical assistant, child life specialist or other support services um, or healthcare professionals that could really advocate for you, um, as well as talk to your primary physician about your concerns regarding wanting more of a participation and collaborative effort in providing treatment recommendations. Um, you could also provide them with resources, again, looking at um, this webinar or training materials, as they may not be aware of such an approach, um, and they may actually be welcoming to it. Okay, there was a question regarding the website for the Institute of Patient and Family Centered Care. Um, there is not a link, but I will go back to um, my references. Okay, it's actually, so if you do have a pen and paper, I would encourage you to write this down. It's www.ipfcc.org. And going back to our reference list, um, you can see here that some of the material was taken from the facts and figures and the hospital self-assessment inventory. Um, that was really helpful in looking at how to integrate this type of approach in your medical setting. have another question here from another parent um, states, as a parent, how can I better participate and collaborate with my child's healthcare team? I think this is also a really great question. Um, I think as parents, we really already have a sense of what will and will not work for our child. And so really expressing previous experiences, your knowledge with how your child responded to treatment, um, things that you have implemented in the past that have or haven't worked, um, just really opening the doors to communication and sharing that information on your end with your practitioner can be helpful for them to have better information to assess your child. Um, you know, an important piece of patient family centered care is respecting that the parent is the child's expert. You know your child best. Um, so if you come in with previous um, knowledge of what's worked and express that, that can really be helpful for the practitioner. Um, you can even come in with support measures that you already know work. Um, and when you come into if it's um, an appointment or if it's a procedure, you can ask the hospital staff to include those support measures, such as um, a blanket from home, um, again, the iPad, like we mentioned earlier, for distraction. Things that have been really successful in the past um, can be really helpful in determining future healthcare experiences. So just really being prepared to advocate for those support measures and to advocate for yourself and your child. We'll take a couple more minutes to take a few more questions. Um, as we wrap up, I would, again, just encourage our listeners to follow us on YouTube or Facebook as we post um, upcoming events. Um, this webinar will also be posted on our YouTube page if you'd like to come back and reflect on specific topics that we discussed. <laughs>